everyone, and thanks for tuning in. Today, I'll be discussing the first genome-wide ancient DNA data from Nubia, which adds to an incredible research program on the Kulignardi Nubians that has spanned over 50 years. So let's first get started with what we know about Nubia. The land that we refer to as Nubia is located along the Nile River, spanning from the first cataract at Aswan in Egypt to the sixth cataract near Khartoum in Sudan. It's completely bisected from north to south by the Nile River and has long served as a corridor for the demic movement and the exchange of culture, goods, and genes between Sub-Saharan Africa, Egypt, and West Eurasia. The site I'll be discussing today, Kulimnardi, is located approximately 130 kilometers south of the border between Egypt and Sudan. It's shown on this map by the Yellow Diamond. The region in which Kulimnardi can be found is called the Batn al-Hajar, which is translated as Belly of Rocks. This region is known to be the most barren and forbidding of all Nubian environments, with no continuous floodplain and only small pockets of alluvial land. Kulubnardi is actually translated as Island of Kulb, however, it's actually only a true island at the peak of the Nile flood. In 1979, two cemeteries situated less than one kilometer apart were excavated at Kulubnardi as part of the UNESCO-funded movement to save the monuments of Nubia. Basically, because of the construction and enlargement of the High Aswan Dam, many of the most important archaeological sites located along the banks of the Nile would be flooded and eventually would be permanently underwater. So archaeologists raced to save as much of the important heritage material and remains from these sites as possible. Now one cemetery was on the island of Kolb, and this is 21S46 or the S Cemetery. And the other cemetery was on the adjacent West Bank, and this is 21R2 or the R Cemetery. Now, a long-standing question has been whether the cemeteries were contemporaneous. So graves from the S and R cemeteries exhibited no typological distinction, in that both had high frequency of slot graves, single burials wrapped in shrouds, and limited grave goods. But the analysis of pottery within the graves and the architectural associations originally suggested that the S cemetery represented a population from the early Christian period, so 550 to 800 CE, and that the R cemetery was in use from the early Christian through the terminal Christian period, meaning that it was used from 550 to around 1400 CE. Analysis of the textiles found in the graves of both cemeteries, however, exhibited characteristics of the early Christian period. So we examine this question of contemporaneity as part of the current work, and we do this using 29 new direct radiocarbon dates. So archaeological and bioarchaeological analysis of the skeletal remains disinterred from these cemeteries suggested that Kulubnardi was home to a single biologically related and culturally homogenous population that was divided into two socially distinct cemetery communities, one buried in each cemetery. So what evidence was there to support this? Well, previous work has shown that individuals from each of the S and R cemeteries appear to be very similar biologically. It's been known for about 40 years now that there are no significant morphological differences in terms of discrete dental traits, cranial non-metric traits, or craniometric traits. Previous work has also suggested that individuals from the SNR cemeteries are culturally similar. First, there were no differences in grave orientation, grave type, head or body positioning, and there was also a lack of grave goods in both cemeteries. There were also no significant relationships between any isotopic indicators related to cemetery of burial, and this suggests no isotopically measurable differences in diet. However, despite biological and cultural similarities, the cemeteries appeared to be socially stratified. Specifically, studies of stress and disease lesions, patterns of growth and development, and average life expectancy suggested that the S community was exposed to more stress, experienced more ill health, and died younger than the R community. For example, you can see that the average age at death is 10.6 years in the S cemetery, as compared to 18.9 years in the R Cemetery. In their 1999 monograph on the site, Adams et al. write about Kulubnardi. The combination of cultural and biological evidence from Kulubnardi suggests a wholly unexpected possibility, that this region in early Christian times was home to two biologically and culturally indistinguishable but socially distinct communities, one of which was considerably better off than the other. For the moment, there is no obvious explanation for this anomaly. Their best hypothesis about the relationship among people at Kulunardi actually comes from ethnographic evidence describing patterns of social interaction in Nubia in the recent past, 
where small groups of impoverished, landless, and semi-nomadic ethnic Nubians acted as sharecroppers or seasonal laborers for landowning families. Now, it's been proposed that this social structure could have existed in Christian times as well, and that the S community comprised a group of individuals who provided labor for members of the more prosperous R community. So, our study uses ancient DNA to investigate the genetic relationship between people in these two cemeteries, among other broader questions about population history in ancient Nubia. So, now transitioning to ancient DNA and the new work that we did, we carried out ancient DNA analysis with two main research aims. One aim was broad, and this was to begin an investigation of the genetic landscape of the Nile Valley before the influence of the Islamic migrations that began in the late first millennium CE. And the second aim was more specific, and that was to address the question about the relationships among people buried in two neighboring cemeteries at Kulabnardi, who show skeletal evidence of differences in morbidity and mortality that are suggestive of differences in social status. And we wanted to do this using a new line of evidence, which is ancient DNA. So before we get into this, I think it's important to know why do we study ancient DNA at all? And akin to the 17th century invention of the light microscope that provided access into a world of microbes and cells, ancient DNA acts as a window into the genetic past, and it enables the direct analysis of genetic variation in long dead organisms. So using modern DNA alone does not always allow us to accurately understand the past, as modern human genetic variation is often shaped by recent events like migration, an admixture that really muddles the genetic signature of people who lived long before these events took place. So that's why we say that ancient DNA allows us a more direct lens into the human past. And importantly, we realized that ancient DNA would be an important tool for exploring questions about population history at Kulabnardi that we might not be able to investigate using any other type of data. So, to generate data, we screened 111 ancient individuals from Kulavnardi for authentic ancient DNA, and we enriched promising libraries that showed evidence of having authentic DNA for sequences overlapping around 1.2 million SNPs from across the genome. Our workflow proceeded like you see here. So we obtained genome-wide data that passed quality control metrics authenticating it as ancient for 66 individuals, 27 of them from the R cemetery and 39 from the S cemetery. And for all analyses, we analyzed these data jointly with sequences from published ancient African and West Eurasian individuals, as well as genotype data from present day people living in Africa and West Eurasia. Now, one of the reasons that we were able to successfully generate the first genome wide data from ancient Nubia, where an extremely hot climate contributes to the degradation of biomolecules is that we extracted DNA from the cochlea of the petrous part of the temporal bone. So the cochlea has been repeatedly shown to be the most DNA dense part of the human skeleton. You can see two studies here where the superior DNA yield from the petrous or the cochlea is illustrated. Now, before we really got into the ancient DNA analysis, we performed radiocarbon dating on 29 individuals and generated um, and constructed a Bayesian chronological model to estimate the start and end dates and duration of Christian style burials in each cemetery. So our direct dates support that the cemeteries were in use uh, contemporaneously. The burials analyzed here span about 650 to 1000 CE, covering part of the so-called early Christian period and the early part of the classic Christian period. Now I'll discuss four key results from our analysis. The first is that all individuals from Kula of Nardi had varying amounts of ancestry like that which is found in a lot of populations such as the Dinka and ancient West Eurasian populations such as those from the Levant. So we use principal component analysis or PCA to illustrate how the individuals from the two Kulabnardi cemeteries relate to ancient and present day people and to each other. So present day individuals, which you can see here represented in symbols of light or color, are arranged in two climes that share a terminus at the bottom right of the plot near Nilo-Saharan speaking peoples from Sudan, South Sudan, and Ethiopia. And we particularly want to focus here on the climb that spans from Nilo-Saharan speakers to West Eurasians. And all along this climb, um, Sudanese Arab, Beja, and Nubian people from the northeast and central regions of Sudan, as well as Afro-Asiatic speakers from Ethiopia and Somalia, um, fall intermediate. And this suggests they have some amount of ancestry that is West Eurasian related. 
Now, we know that Western-Asian-related ancestry has been present in Northeast Africa for at least 5,000 years and maybe even far longer. Um, but we also know that the genetic structure of present-day Nubian groups has been influenced by a relatively recent spread of Western-Asian-related ancestry southward along the Nile during the Arab conquest of the late 1st and 2nd millennia CE. Um, so we plot the individuals from Kulub Nardi um, on this PCA, and we find that they fall along the Nilo-Saharan West Eurasian Cline, suggesting that they have both types of ancestry. The Kulub Nardi Nubians on average are shifted slightly towards present-day West Eurasians relative to present-day Nubian groups. And we observe a moderate spread of individuals from Kulub Nardi along this cline, suggesting individual variation in the proportion of West Eurasian and Nilotic-related ancestry. We use F3, admix F3 statistics, to formally test whether the Kulubnardi Nubians were admix between an allotic related and a West Eurasian related population. And our finding of a consistently negative statistic, no matter which populations we use uh, for West Eurasian related ancestry, supports a history of admixture between people related, perhaps very deeply, to these populations. Now, we wanted to know whether any individuals were genetic outliers who had a significant excess of Nilotic or West Eurasian related ancestry relative to other individuals. Now, to test this, we performed an F4 statistic test for each individual. If the results were significantly negative, it meant that the individual had significantly more West Eurasian related ancestry than others at Kulub Nardi. If it was significantly positive, it meant that the individual had more Nilotic related ancestry than others at Kulub Nardi. So in total, we identified six outlier individuals, one who had significantly more West Eurasian related ancestry, and five who had significantly more Nilotic related ancestry. Then to obtain insight into the relative proportions of Nilotic and West Eurasian related ancestry and the source of West Eurasian related ancestry at Kulub Nardi, we apply the QPADM framework that enables us to model the Kulub Nardi Nubians as descended from two-way admixture between a Nilotic related and a West Eurasian related population while also differentiating between possible sources of West Eurasian related ancestry using a set of differentially related L groups. So we examine the fit of 21 ancient populations from West Eurasia or with high levels of West Eurasian related ancestry as the best proxy for the West Eurasian related source of ancestry at Kulub Nardi. With this set of proxy populations used as a source of our model, we obtained a fit only when Egypt was used as a, uh, the West Eurasian related proxy. And these are three ancient e Egyptian individuals for which we have genome-wide data that have been previously published. So with this model, we estimated that around 60% ancestry in the Kulub Nardi Nubians is Egyptian related. However, these ancient Egyptians have also been shown to harbor a non-trivial amount of sub-Saharan African related ancestry, which we estimate here to be about 5%. So this model doesn't really tell us the right proportion of West Eurasian related ancestry in the Kulub Nardi Nubians, or tell us really from where that West Eurasian ancestry ultimately derived. So we remove Egypt from our model. And we rerun this model and find that the only fitting model is one using Bronze and Iron Age Levantine populations as a source for the West Eurasian related ancestry at Kulub Nardi. And we estimate that the Kulub Nardi Nubians had around 57.5% of this ancestry, though it was probably introduced through nu to Nubia through ancient Egyptians or a group related to them. Our second key result is that there's no evidence that people buried in the S cemetery were genetically different than people buried in the R cemetery. So in addition to similarities between the S and R cemetery people and PCA, we find that 33 individuals from Kulub Nardi had at least one and up to five genetic relationships in our data set, and they shared 28 pairwise genetic relationships that formed eight extended families. Now, really importantly, we document seven relative pairs, the closest being second degree relatives, where one individual was buried in the R cemetery and the other was buried in the S cemetery. And overall, we find only a modest degree of enrichment of relative pairs buried in the same cemetery versus in different cemeteries. So while increasingly closely related individuals were more likely to be buried in the same cemetery, the observed number of inter-cemetery relative burials indicate no clearly defined alignment between relatives and social grouping, if indeed the cemeteries were stratified.
So this is consistent with a scenario of fluidity between groups and the absence of a caste-like social system of uh, division at Kulignarni. We then applied statistical tests to examine for subtle genetic differences between the people in the R and S cemeteries. Now, in the interest of time, and because there's really not that pretty graphics that go along with these, um, I'm not gonna read them. But of course, please feel free to pause on the screen and uh, read these results. However, the take home point is that multiple different quantitative analyses showed no differences in ancestry between people in the S and R cemeteries. Our third key result is that the admixture events that contributed to the gene pool of Kulabnardi occurred over a period of around a millennium. Now, we use the DATE software to estimate the average timing of the admixture events that contributed to the Kulabnardi gene pool. We estimate that admixture um, occurred on average of around 22 generations or about 620 years before the studied individuals lived. Now, using 815 CE as the midpoint of the calibrated model age range for Kulabnardi, this places admixture occurring on average during the early 2nd to late 3rd century CE, although the dates obtained with this me method are based on a model of a single pulse of admixture, and they therefore reflect an intermediate value if the true history includes multiple waves or continuous admixture, which is really likely at Kulabnardi given the inter-individual level variance and ancestry proportions. Um, we also apply dates to each individual from Kulinardi. So on the plot that I show here, we show data for 20 individuals who have direct radiocarbon dates, as well as dates estimate. Amazingly, we observe point estimates ranging from around 200 BCE to 660 CE, confirming that waves of admixture over possibly roughly a millennium, could have contributed to the formation of the Kulabnardi gene pool. Now the final key result is that West Eurasian related ancestry at Kulabnardi was disproportionately associated with female ancestors. Previous morphological analysis really found no evidence of sex-specific patterns of mobility at Kulabnardi, but this has not yet been explored using genetic data. So to investigate at a higher resolution, if the, if the West Eurasian related ancestry was introduced into Kulabnardi via sex bias admixture, we analyzed male and female demographic histories separately. Now, what you're seeing here is, is how we study this. Because females carry two thirds of the X chromosomes in a population, but only half of the autosomes, the X chromosome can be used to detect a signal of asymmetrical admixture between males and females. And you can see this illustrated here, um, and this is an image from Scogland et al. 2016. Now, we used our QPADM model to compute ancestry proportions on the autosome and on the X chromosome of the Kulinardi Nubians. So we found that West Eurasian related ancestry modeled, again, using that Levant Bronze Age, Iron Age group as a proxy, accounts for around 57.5% of the ancestry of the autosomes, but around 64.4% of ancestry in the X chromosomes in the Kulabnardi Nubians. And this reveals that West Eurasian related ancestry at Kulabnardi was disproportionately derived from female ancestors. Now, this highlights the importance of female mobility and suggests that Kulabnardi could have been a patrilocal society. And I think this is a really important and exciting line of research to pursue further in the future. So with that, I want to acknowledge the ancient people from Kulabnardi who we study as part of this work, the present day people who made invaluable contributions to this study, and the NSF for supporting this work. So thank you for listening. Um, the preprint, of this paper is available now on BioArchive. Um, please feel free to reach out to me with any questions. All aligned sequencing data will be available through the ENA under um, this accession number um, upon publication of this manuscript and genotype data will also be available on the Reich Lab website. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, Dr. Vanessa Campanacho for inviting me to give this talk. Thanks so much.